This hour, a select committee of the United States Senate is about to begin public hearings on something called Watergate. One year ago today, Watergate was just an address, a rather fancy, expensive address in this capital city. But now it has come to symbolize much more. The word crisis is perhaps too mild to apply to Watergate. President Nixon's White House has been shaken. Indeed, the entire executive branch of the government has been jolted by the continuing accusations and... Uh, Revelations, most of them, it uh, must be kept in mind, not yet proved. Seven men, only seven men, have been convicted for their part in the burglary. We see you now, we see now Senator Sam Irvin, who is the chairman of the uh, select committee, engaging in some banter there with the photographers who are clustered all about him. Senator Irvin will be the man wielding the gavel during these uh, hearings, and he is about to do that right now. Senator Irvin has called these hearings the most important investigation ever entrusted to the Congress. He is well known as perhaps the foremost authority on the United States Senate, a former judge. There goes the gavel and the Watergate hearings are underway. I think, Sam, you got copies of the resolution. Thanks for putting the record. You got copies of the resolution. Put the record. The committee will come to order. <clears throat> Today, the Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities begins hearings into the extent to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were involved in the 1972 presidential election campaign. Senate Resolution 60, which established the Select Committee, was adopted unanimously by the Senate on February the 7th, 1973. Under its provisions, every member of the Senate joined in giving the committee a broad mandate to investigate as fully as possible all the ramifications of the Watergate break-in which occurred on Saturday, June 17, 1972. Under the terms of the authorizing resolution, the committee must complete its study and render its report on or before February 28, 1974. Of necessity, that report will reflect the considered judgment of the committee on whatever new legislation is needed to help safeguard the electoral process through which the President of the United States is chosen. We are beginning these hearings today in an atmosphere of utmost gravity. The questions that have been raised in the wake of the June 17 break-in strike at the very undergirding of our dem democracy. If the many allegations made to this day are true, then the burglars who broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee at Watergate were in effect breaking into the home of every citizen of the United States. And if these allegations proved to be true, what they were seeking to steal was not the jewels, money, or other property of American citizens, but something much more valuable, their most precious heritage, the right to vote in a free election. Since that day, a mood of incred uh, incredulity <coughs> has prevailed among our populace, and it is the constitutional duty of this committee to act expeditiously, to allay the fears being expressed by the citizenry, and to establish the factual basis upon which these fears have been founded. The first phase of the committee's investigation will probe the planning and execution of the wiretapping and break-in of the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate complex and the alleged cover-up that followed. Subsequent phases will focus on allegations of campaign espionage and subversion and allegations of extensive violations of campaign financing laws. The clear mandate of the unanimous Senate resolution provides for a bipartisan investigation of every phase of political espionage and illegal fundraising. Thus, it is clear that we have the full responsibility to recommend any remedial legislation necessary. In pursuing this task, it is clear that the committee will be dealing with the workings of the democratic process under which we operate. In a nation which that still is the last best hope of mankind in his eternal struggle to govern himself decently and effectively, we will be concerned with the integrity of a governmental system designed by men who understood the lessons of the past and who accordingly established a framework of separated governmental powers in order to prevent any one branch of the government from becoming dominant over the others. The founding fathers having participated in the struggle against arbitrary power, 
comprehended some eternal truths respecting men and government. They knew that those who are entrusted with power are susceptible to disease of tyrants, which George Washington rightly described as love of power and proneness to abuse it. For that reason, they realized that the power of public officers should be defined by laws which they, as well as the people, are obligated to obey. A truth enunciated by Daniel Webster when he said that whatever government is not a government of laws is a despotism, let it be called what it may. To the end of ensuring a society governed by laws, these men embodied in our Constitution the enduring principles in which they so firmly believed, of establishing a legislature to make all laws, an executive to carry them out, and a judicial system to interpret them. Recently, we have been faced with massive challenges to the historical framework created in 1787, with the most recent fairs having been focused upon assertions by the administration of both parties of executive power over the Congress, for example, in the empowerment of appropriated funds and the abuse of executive privileges. These challenges, however, can and are being dealt with by the workings of the system itself. That is, through the enactment of powerful statutes by the Congress and the rendering of decisions by the courts upholding the lawmaking power of the Congress. In dealing with the challenges posed by the multitudinous allegations arising out of the Watergate affair, however, the Select Committee has a task much more difficult and complex than dealing with intrusions of one branch of the government upon the powers of the others. It must probe assert into assertions that the very system itself has been subverted and its foundations shaken. To safeguard the structural scheme of our governmental system, the founding fathers provided for an electoral process by which the elected officials of this nation should be chosen. The Constitution later adopted amendments, and more specifically, statutory law, provide that the electoral processes shall be conducted by the people outside the confines of the formal branches of the government and through a political process that must operate under the strictures of law and ethical guidelines, but independent of the overwhelming power of the government itself. Only then can we be sure that each election truly reflects the will of the people and that the electoral process cannot be made to serve as a mere handmaiden made of a particular administration and power. If the allegations that have been made in the wake of the Watergate affair are substantiated, there has been a very serious subversion of the integrity of the electoral process, and the committee will be obliged to consider the matter in which such a subversion affects the continued existence of this nation as a representative of democracy, and how, if we are to survive, such subversions may be prevented in the future. future. It has been asserted that the 1972 campaign was influenced by a wide variety of illegal or unethical activities, including the widespread wiretapping of the telephones, political headquarters, and even the residences of candidates and their campaign staffs, and of members of the press by the publication of forged documents designed to defame certain candidates or enhance others through fraudulent means. The infiltration and disruption of opponents' political organizations and gatherings the raising and handling of campaign contributions through means designed to circumvent, either in letter or in spirit, the provisions of campaign disclosure acts, and even the acceptance of campaign contributions based upon promises of illegal interference in government processes on behalf of the contributors. Finally, and perhaps most disturbingly, it has been alleged that, following the Watergate break-in, there has been a massive attempt to cover up all the improper activities extending even so far as to pay off potential witnesses, and in particular, the seven defendants in the Watergate trial in exchange for their promise to remain silent. Activities which, if true, represent in interference in the integrity of the prosecutorial and judicial processes of this nation. Moreover, there has been evidence of the use of governmental in instrumentalities in efforts to exercise political surveillance over candidates in the 1972 campaign. Let me emphasize at the outset that our judicial process thus far has convicted only the seven persons accused of burglarizing and wiretapping the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate complex on June 17. The hearings which we initiate today are not designed to intensify or reiterate unfounded accusations or to poison further the political climate of our nation. On the contrary, 
It is my conviction and that of the other committee members that the accusations that have been leveled and the evidence of wrongdoing that has surfaced has cast a black cloud of distrust over our entire society. Our citizens do not know whom to believe, and many of them have concluded that all the processes of government have become so compromised that honest governance has been rendered impossible. We believe that the health, if not the survival of our social structure and of our form of government, requires the most candid and public investigation of all the evidence and of all the accusations that have been leveled at, at any persons at whatever level who were engaged in the 1972 campaign. My colleagues on the committee and I are determined to uncover all the relevant facts surrounding these matters and to spare no one, whatever his station in life may be, in our efforts to accomplish that goal. At the same time, I want to emphasize that the purpose of these hearings is not prosecutorial or judicial, but rather investigative and informative. No one is more cognizant than I of the separation of powers issues that hover over these hearings. <laughs> The committee is fully aware of the ongo ongoing grand jury proceedings that are taking place in several areas of the country and of the fact that criminal indictments have been returned already by one of these grand juries. Like all Americans, the members of this committee are vitally interested in seeing that the judicial processes operate effectively and fairly and without interference from any other branch of the government. The investigation of this select committee was born of crisis, unabated as of this very time. The crisis of amounting loss of confidence by American citizens in the integrity of our electoral process, which is the bedrock of our democracy. The American people are looking to this committee as a representative of all the Congress for enlightenment and guidance regarding the details of the allegations regarding the subversion of our electoral and political processes. As the elected representatives of the people, we would be derelict in our duty to them if we fail to pursue our mission expeditiously, fully, and with the utmost fairness. The aim of the committee is to provide full and open public testimony in order that the nation can proceed towards the healing of the wounds that now afflict the body politic. It is that aim that we are here to pursue today within the terms of the mandate imposed upon us by our colleagues and in full compliance with all applicable rules of law. The nation and history itself are watching us. We cannot fail our mission.